Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley. Appreciate you all being here for the virtualization chat talk and food stuff this morning. This afternoon we have something that uh, is very, very cool. And so I'm not going to do a whole lot of talking. I'm just going to introduce you to a bunch of people. Um, let's, you're going to hear from Jonathan Schwartz, our CEO, and of course Dave. Uh, what was your name again? <laughs> Greg Papadopoulos, our CTO, and. Um, you have to ask Greg where he was this morning, which was yet another cool thing, uh, but he'll tell you in a minute. And then, where is where's Mr. Douglas? They, they, oh, Before way in the corner, Dave Douglas, uh, uh, Chief Advanced Technology VP and Chief Architect of what you're going to hear about. And then Darlene, if you could stand up and just wave your hands for just a minute. So Darlene Yapley, uh, been with Sun a long time, but she's the uh, new VP of Marketing and Business Development for Project Black Box, which means you can go ask her all the questions rather than me later on. Okay, with that, I present to you our CEO, Jonathan Schwartz. Great, thank you. Um, and first of all, thank you all. Um, thank you, Greg. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you all very much for taking the time to come join us. Um, and, uh, and rather than take up a lot of time with slides, uh, which I'm going to do in a moment, um, context for why we built what we did and where we think the market opportunity is going to be and where we think the thing is headed and frankly that's much better off um, or you'll be much better off if Greg is telling you and actually giving you a physical walkthrough of what's been built um, and I think you'll agree with me it's, it's definitely an interesting and exciting concept so at a top level when you know one of the challenges that we have in the marketplace is this is how Wall Street thinks about the industry it's how most reporters think about the industry well you got some software players you got some server players you got the storage guys you got the services folks and uh, frankly standing alone in any one of these industries our ability to differentiate just you know foot to foot against somebody who's exclusively focused on one thing the our market differentiation is going to be relatively small now the reason for that is there's folks who are way bigger than we are or have been in the industry for you know a century and we obviously haven't. Um, but the one thing that we, I think, have great confidence in at Sun is that we're never gonna lack for creative ideas, but we're never gonna frankly be able to think in just this way. And the reason for that is if you look at the history of the company, it's all about how do we bring together the best of you know, standard components in the marketplace, generally accepted uh, technologies, bring the new innovations to the marketplace that will actually give us significant and substantive differentiation. By the way, part of that comes from just having really clever and creative people all across Sun, but a lot of it also comes because we hang out with some really interesting customers who express to us problems and challenges that we go away and think about and then come back with a somewhat novel solution around. And so the, the, the future of Sun is somewhat the history of Sun. And frankly, I think the future of our industry, and there's a wonderful book that you should all read called The Box by a guy named Mark Levinson. In my view, the, the future of our industry is more going to be rooted in, uh, in our history than anyone will recognize. And that implies that our next generation market opportunity is going to come from the core systems innovation that is at the intersection of the world of storage, the world of systems, the world of software, and the world of network computing. And there is, to me, no purer expression of that intersection in the Venn diagram than the black box you're going to hear about today, because it really does bring together all of the innovation and all of the, of the spheres that we do at Sun. And again, that's about $2 billion a year focused in the center of the Venn diagram. So I want to um, give you a, uh, a quick overview. And I'm actually stealing a slide that um, Greg came up with a while back. And uh, talked about what's happening in the industry because partially what we've been doing in the past 141 days not that I've been counting um, Has been focusing in on what do we build and then the as, as interesting a question And if you think about our economics at Sun microsystems as substantive financially a question is for whom are we building it? We spend about two billion dollars a year in R&D and about two billion dollars a year in the sales force and marketing teams and go-to-market uh, market functions for the company so it's as literally as, as significant the choice for Sun in choosing our customers as it is in selecting the R&D that we're gonna go do. Now, for us, the market is actually splitting into two very different uh, types. And in talking about the first set of customers, what you really need to do is look at the size of the marketplace relative to GDP. 
because there's a very large collection of customers around the world, and I'd argue probably 30 or 40 percent of the revenue of Sun comes from customers who are whose businesses will be a derivative of how fast the GDP grows. Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley. So if you think about an airline or a grocery store or a tire company or somebody who builds heavy equipment, for the most part, their business is going to be a derivative of GDP growth. If the economy gets bigger, they can spend more money. If the economy shrinks, fewer people are going to take um, trips on airplanes, fewer people are going to want to build new big buildings, fewer people are going to need tires to go drive around because for whatever reason gas may be expensive. And so there's a segment of the marketplace, and I categorize actually my favorite example of this is my dentist, and I was just with my dentist recently, very nice lady, and she has a server in her office. And what does she do with that server? She manages patients, she keeps track of you know, schedules, and she maybe keeps track of some patient information. But if you think about what's going to happen next year at that dentist's office, Moore's Law is going to enable her to spend less on IT next year. Why? Because the systems will probably be twice as fast, but they'll cost the same and maybe less. And so for a very significant portion of the marketplace, Moore's Law actually depresses spending because if you can do more with less, you will. And as a result, for at least this band of the marketplace, their IT spending will decline year to year. And a good example of that inside of Sun is we are in the midst of rolling out a new IT system, a new ERP system, for the whole of this $13 billion company with 35,000 employees and you know, uh, markets that span the planet, 70 countries. The total spending on that IT system for Sun will be $8 million. And if you talk to Greg or John Fowler or David Yen about that $8 million, what they'll say is just wait six months and it'll be $5 million. Because every speed bump, every enhancement to the roadmap just makes us that much more efficient. So if you were in business to sell ERP systems to Sun Microsystems, you'd be out of business pretty quickly because you'd be shrinking as our systems got faster. But now there's another portion of Sun. And that portion of Sun is doing the work to design the next generation microprocessor. And their appetite for computation cycles exceeds Moore's law. Because the more capacity we give to them to simulate circuits and do the analytics, the more rapidly they can get to market. That, the size of the spending on that grid, that branch inside of Sun, is a derivative of only one thing, which is how big a check will Greg, Mike, and I write to the team that wants to build it. And it will literally be a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollar grid. And you'll see comparable grids being grown across the world by companies whose workloads outstrip Moore's Law. And whether you call those companies the Web 2.0 companies, or the next generation media companies, or the high performance community, um, there are a very significant portion of customers in the world for whom Moore's Law will be insufficient to depress their spending. And the net result of which is they will start building out very large data centers and they will continue to build them for as long as they can. Why? Because there's a return on that grid. There's a return from better analytics, from smarter decisions, from new customers, from new value. And, and just to give you one example of this, um, that dentist, at some point there will be a dentistonline.com who will aggregate all of the patient administration across every small dentist office around the country. They will be a core customer of ours. In the interim, we don't want to spend a lot of time trying to lobby a dentist office to buy a, to buy a tower server from Sun. Therefore, we're not going to build a tower server. And whether it's salesforce.com or the trading algorithms at Citigroup or the next generation search at Google or the massive auction system that eBay has built, these are the kinds of customers for whom Moore's Law is helpful but insufficient. And if you talk to those customers about the kind of constraints that they're facing right now, you'll hear a very different tune than the kind of issues faced by these customers. Because these customers care about, I need professional services, I need someone to come in and help me you know, just manage what I'm doing. Maybe I'll outsource it, maybe I can find cheaper labor around the world. The folks on the top are actually not really affected by cheaper labor. What they care about is time to market. And what every customer in that upper bracket tells me, and I think tells everybody uh, at Sun as we interact with them, are these are the things that are just killing them. The single biggest uh, uh, variable in determining the return on their investments is becoming power. You know, the second largest operating expense in most web companies is electricity, second only to payroll. 
So if we can be 2% more efficient or 5% more efficient and your bill is 100 million a year, that's real money. Secondly, they're out of space. They, uh, as a result of the way they have to build out their data centers, they have to leave lots of floor space between each rack of computers. They don't have the power and the density to be able to build anything bigger. The net result of that is they chew up enormous real estate and in some very expensive locations around the world, midtown Manhattan, downtown London, downtown Tokyo. They are continually frustrated by the fact that their data centers are taking three years to build or a quarter of a billion dollars when what they want to do is really get access to an instant on capability they can put where they need it. And by the way, they may move it because the power rates may change or because a market emerges in a place they didn't expect it and they want to move computation there quickly and readily. So when we sat down to really think through this problem, it wasn't a matter of how do we take an existing data center and try to improve it. It was instead, how do we rethink the entire concept of a data center? And rather than simply look at how do we build computers for an existing data center, it was instead, how do we go look into the marketplace and figure out what should replace the existing data center? So just to be clear and to make sure that there's no uh, confusion in the marketplace, we do not believe that the existing data centers will be shut down. We do not believe they are dead. We do not believe that they are anachronisms and that no one will spend money there. We just believe that as customers continue to look at where they invest new dollars, their appetite and willingness to put a quarter of a billion dollars into a data center that will take three years to be built is plummeting. And what they want is a choice. And what we believe we can present is exactly that. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Pop Doc. Gervais Restaurant, authentic French cuisine in Silicon Valley.